weirdos. Before we get into this episode, I want to encourage you to keep listening to the very end of the episode. We're going to be giving you a sample of the newest episode from the other podcast that I host, Allegedly. And this one stars Jonathan Frakes from Star Trek The Next Generation. So keep listening through to the end to give it a listen. Stories and content in weird darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. One of the greatest religious movements of the 19th century began in the bedroom of two young girls living in a farmhouse in Hydesville, New York. On a late March day in 1848, Margareta Maggie Fox, 14, and Kate, her 11-year-old sister, waylaid a neighbor eager to share an odd and frightening phenomenon. Every night around bedtime, they said, they heard a series of raps on the walls and furniture raps that seemed to manifest with a peculiar, otherworldly intelligence. The neighbor, skeptical, came to see for herself, joining the girls in the small chamber they shared with their parents. While Maggie and Kate huddled together on their bed, their mother Margaret began the demonstration. Now, count five, she ordered, and the room shook with the sound of five heavy thuds. Count fifteen, she commanded and the mysterious presence obeyed. Next, she asked it to tell the neighbor's age. Thirty-three distinct raps followed. If you are an injured spirit, she continued, manifest it by three raps. And it did. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… Harry Houdini may have been one of the world's greatest magicians but he was also the biggest debunker of magic when it came to the supernatural. There are strong women, there are formidable ladies, there are tough cookies, there are female baddies, and then there is stagecoach Mary Fields, who was surely in a class all her own. Dozens of creepy stories and urban legends have sprouted up along America's most legendary highway we look at some of the horrifying things that people have experienced on Route 66. It was one of the wildest and wickedest of all Wild West towns, and now it's one of the most haunted. Jerome, Arizona is considered the most haunted town in the state, possibly in all of the United States. But first, their seances with the departed launched a mass religious movement and then one of them confessed that it was common delusion. We'll look at the rise of spiritualism and the two sisters that started it all. We begin with that story. If you're new here, welcome to the show. And while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to enter contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Margaret Fox did not seem to consider the date. March 31st, April Fool's Eve, and the possibility that her daughters were frightened not by an unseen presence, but by the unexpected success of their prank. The Fox family deserted the house and sent Maggie and Kate to live with their older sister, Leah Fox Fish, in Rochester. The story may have died there were it not for the fact that Rochester was a hotbed for reform and religious activity the same vicinity, the Finger Lakes region of New York State, which gave birth to Mormonism and Millerism, the precursor of Seventh-day Adventists. 
Community leaders Isaac and Amy Post were intrigued by the Fox sisters' story and by the subsequent rumor that the spirit likely belonged to a peddler who had been murdered in the farmhouse five years beforehand. A group of Rochester residents examined the cellar of the Fox's home, uncovering strands of hair and what appeared to be bone fragments. The Posts invited the girls to a gathering at their home, anxious to see if they could communicate with spirits in another locale. I suppose I went with as much unbelief as Thomas felt when he was introduced to Jesus after he had ascended, Isaac Post wrote, but he was swayed by very distinct thumps under the floor and several apparent answers. He was further convinced when Leah Fox also proved to be a medium, communicating with the Post's recently deceased daughter. The Post's rented the largest hall in Rochester, and 400 people came to hear the mysterious noises. Afterward, Amy Post accompanied the sisters to a private chamber where they disrobed and were examined by a committee of skeptics who found no evidence of a hoax. The idea that one could communicate with spirits was hardly new. The Bible contains hundreds of references of angels administering to man, but the movement known as modern spiritualism sprang from several distinct revolutionary philosophies and characters. The ideas and practices of Franz Anton Mesmer, an 18th-century Australian healer, had spread to the United States and by the 1840s held the country in thrall. Mesmer proposed that everything in the universe, including the human body, was governed by a magnetic fluid that could become imbalanced, causing illness. By waving his hands over a patient's body, he induced a mesmerized hypnotic state that allowed him to manipulate the magnetic force and restore health. Amateur mesmerists became a popular attraction at parties and in parlors, a few proving skillful enough to attract paying customers. Some who awakened from a mesmeric trance claimed to have experienced visions of spirits from another dimension. At the same time, the ideas of Emanuel Swedenborg, an 18th-century Swedish philosopher and mystic, also surged in popularity. Swedenborg described an afterlife consisting of three heavens, three hells, and an interim destination, the world of the spirits, where everyone went immediately upon dying and was more or less similar to what they were accustomed to on Earth. Self-love drove one toward the varying degrees of hell. Love for others elevated one to the heavens. The Lord casts no one into hell, he wrote, but those who are there have deliberately cast themselves into it and keep themselves there. He claimed to have seen and talked with spirits on all of the planes. Seventy-five years later, the 19th-century American seer Andrew Jackson Davis, who would become known as the John the Baptist of modern spiritualism, combined these two ideologies, claiming that Swedenborg's spirit spoke to him during a series of mesmeric trances. Davis recorded the content of these messages and in 1847 published them in a voluminous tome titled The Principles of Nature, Her Divine Revelations, and A Voice to Mankind. It is a truth, he asserted, predicting the rise of spiritualism, that spirits commune with one another while one is in the body and the other in the higher spheres. All the world will hail with delight the ushering in of that era when the interiors of men will be opened and the spiritual communication will be established. Davis believed his prediction materialized just a year later, on the very day the Fox sisters first channeled spirits in their bedroom. About daylight this morning, he confided in his diary, a warm breathing passed over my face, and I heard a voice, tender and strong, saying, Brother, the good work has begun. Behold, a living demonstration is born. Upon hearing of the Rochester incident, Davis invited the Fox sisters to his home in New York City to witness their medium capabilities for himself. Joining his cause with the sisters' ghostly manifestations elevated his stature from obscure prophet to recognized leader of a mass movement, one that appealed to increasing numbers of Americans inclined to reject the gloomy Calvinistic doctrine of predestination and embrace the reform-minded optimism of the mid-19th century. Unlike their Christian contemporaries, Americans who adopted spiritualism believed that they had a hand in their own salvation, and direct communication with those who had passed 
offered insight into the ultimate fate of their own souls. Maggie, Kate, and Leah Fox embarked on a professional tour to spread word of the spirits, booking a suite fittingly at Barnum's Hotel on the corner of Broadway and Maiden Lane, an establishment owned by a cousin of the famed showman. An editorial in the Scientific American scoffed at their arrival, calling the girls the spiritual knockers from Rochester. They conducted their sessions in the hotel's parlor, inviting as many as 30 attendees to gather around a large table at the hours of 10 a.m., 5 p.m., and 8 p.m., taking on occasional private meetings in between. Admission was $1, and visitors included preeminent members of New York society – Horace Greeley, the iconoclastic and influential editor of the New York Tribune, James Fenimore Cooper, editor and poet William Cullen Bryant, and abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, who witnessed a session in which the spirits wrapped in time to a popular song and spelled out a message, spiritualism will work miracles in the cause of reform. Leah stayed in New York, entertaining callers in a seance room, while Kate and Maggie took the show to other cities, among them Cleveland, Cincinnati, Columbus, St. Louis, Washington, D.C., and Philadelphia, where one visitor, explorer Elisha Kent Kane, succumbed to Maggie's charms even as he deemed her a fraud, although he couldn't prove how the sounds were made. After a whole month's trial, I could make nothing of them, he confessed. Therefore, they are a great mystery. He actually courted Maggie, 13 years his junior, and encouraged her to give up her life of dreary sameness and suspected deceit. She acquiesced, retiring to attend school at Kane's behest and expense, and married him shortly before his untimely death in 1857. To honor his memory, she converted to Catholicism, as Kane, a Presbyterian, had always encouraged. He seemed to think that the faith's ornate iconography and sense of mystery would appeal to her. In mourning, she began drinking heavily and vowed to keep her promise to Kane to wholly and forever abandon spiritualism. Kate, meanwhile, married a devout spiritualist and continued to develop her medium powers, translating spirit messages in astonishing and unprecedented ways, communicating two messages simultaneously, writing one while speaking the other, transcribing messages in reverse script, utilizing blank cards upon which words seem to spontaneously appear. During sessions with a wealthy banker, Charles Livermore, she summoned both the man's deceased wife and the ghost of Benjamin Franklin, who announced his identity by writing his name on a card. Her business boomed during and after the Civil War, as increasing numbers of the bereaved found solace in spiritualism. Prominent spiritualist Emma Hardinge wrote that the war added two million new believers to the movement, and by the 1880s there was an estimated eight million spiritualists in the United States and Europe. These new practitioners, seduced by the flamboyance of the Gilded Age, experienced miracles, like Kate's summoning of full-fledged apparitions at every seance. It was wearying both to the movement and to Kate herself, and she too began to drink. On October 21, 1888, the New York World published an interview with Maggie Fox in anticipation of her appearance that evening at the New York Academy of Music, where she would publicly denounce spiritualism. She was paid $1,500 for the exclusive. Her main motivation, however, was rage at her sister Leah and other leading spiritualists who had publicly chastised Kate for her drinking and accused her of being unable to care for her two young children. Kate planned to be in the audience when Maggie gave her speech, lending her tacit support. My sister Katie and myself were very young children when this horrible deception began, Maggie said. At night, when we went to bed, we used to tie an apple on a string and move the string up and down, causing the apple to bump on the floor. Or we would drop the apple on the floor, making a strange noise every time it would rebound. The sisters graduated from apple dropping to manipulating their knuckles, joints, and toes to make rapping sounds. A great many people, when they hear the rapping, imagine at once that these spirits are touching them, she explained. It's a very common delusion. Some very wealthy people came to see me some years ago when I lived in 42nd Street and I did some rappings for them. 
I made the spirit rap on the chair, and one of the ladies cried out, I feel the spirit tapping me on the shoulder. Of course, that was pure imagination. She offered a demonstration, removing her shoe and placing her right foot upon a wooden stool. The room fell silent, and still she was rewarded with a number of short, little raps. There stood a black-robed, sharp-faced widow, the New York Herald reported, working her big toe and solemnly declaring that it was in this way she created the excitement that has driven so many persons to suicide or insanity. One moment it was ludicrous, the next it was weird. Maggie insisted that her sister Leah knew that the wrappings were fake all along and greedily exploited her younger sisters. Before exiting the stage, she thanked God that she was able to expose spiritualism. The mainstream press called the incident a death blow to the movement, and spiritualists quickly took sides. Shortly after Maggie's confession, the spirit of Samuel B. Britton, former publisher of the Spiritual Telegraph, appeared during a seance to offer a sympathetic opinion. Although Maggie was an authentic medium, he acknowledged the band of spirits attending during the early part of her career has been usurped by other unseen intelligences who are not scrupulous in their dealings with humanity. Other living spiritualists charged that Maggie's change of heart was wholly mercenary. Since she had failed to make a living as a medium, she sought to profit by becoming one of spiritualism's fiercest critics. Whatever her motive, Maggie recanted her confession one year later, insisting that her spirit guides had beseeched her to do so. Her reversal prompted more disgust from devoted spiritualists, many of whom failed to recognize her at a subsequent debate at the Manhattan Liberal Club. There, under the pseudonym Mrs. Spencer, Maggie revealed several tricks of the profession, including the way mediums wrote messages on blank slates by using their teeth or feet. She never reconciled with Sister Leah, who died in 1890. Kate died two years later while on a drinking spree. Maggie passed away eight months later, in March 1893. That year, spiritualists formed the National Spiritualist Association, which today is known as the National Spiritualist Association of Churches. In 1904, schoolchildren playing in the sisters' childhood home in Hydesville known locally as the Spook House, discovered the majority of a skeleton between the earth and crumbling cedar walls. A doctor was consulted who estimated that the bones were about 50 years old, giving credence to the sisters' tale of spiritual messages from a murdered peddler. But not everyone was convinced. The New York Times reported that the bones had created a stir amusingly disproportioned to any necessary significance of the discovery and suggested that the sisters had merely been clever enough to exploit a local mystery. Even if the bones were that of the murdered peddler, the Times concluded, there will still remain that dreadful confession about the clicking joints which reduces the whole case to a farce. Five years later, another doctor examined the skeleton and determined that it was made up of only a few ribs with odds and ends of bones and among them a superabundance of some and a deficiency of others. Among them also were chicken bones. He also reported a rumor that a man living near the spook house had planted the bones as a practical joke, but was much too ashamed to come clean. Harry Houdini, the world's greatest escape artist, may have been known for his unbelievable escapes from cages and underwater tanks, but these aren't his only claim to fame. The illusionist, a skilled and perceptive individual, was also hell-bent on exposing the fraudulent mediums and psychics that gained popularity during the surge of spiritualism in the 1920s. Houdini did whatever it took to prove that people were being conned by these alleged mediums, going as far as to tarnish his friendship with acclaimed author and spiritualist enthusiast Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Houdini outed Marguerite Crandon, Nino Pecorero, and hundreds of other self-proclaimed psychics who were simply great sleight-of-hand performers. Houdini was skeptical of the growing spiritualist movement, but tragedy allegedly made him take a second look 
at the validity of seances and mediums. On July 17, 1913, Houdini's mother, Cecilia Steiner Weiss, passed after suffering a stroke. Houdini was close to his mother and was even quoted as writing, if God in his greatness ever sent an angel on earth in human form, it was my mother. Houdini struggled for months after his mother's passing, writing to his brother Theo, I can write all right when I keep away from that heart-rendering subject so we'll try and avoid it if possible. But I have to write to my brother once in a while about her whom we miss and for her with whom I feel as if my heart of hearts went with her. Many believe his intense heartache is the reason he started dabbling in spiritualism and eventually started to debunk it out of frustration. But Houdini historians often note the illusionist actually attended his first seance as a child when he tried to contact his recently deceased half-brother, Herman. Even at an early age, Houdini suspected that seances and mediums were hogwash. From January 1918 to December 1920, the H1N1 virus, known then as the Spanish flu, ravaged the world. Nearly a third of the world population, or 500 million people, contracted the virus, and 3 to 5 percent of the world's population perished. Combined with the casualties of conflict, many people were searching for answers as to what happened to their loved ones after they left this mortal coil. Spiritualism was everywhere, from a neighbor's living room to the cinema. The popularity of the movement clashed with empirical science, which was also experiencing a resurgence. Houdini was friends with author Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of Sherlock Holmes. Like Houdini, Conan Doyle also had an interest in spiritualism, but it wasn't one of contempt like the illusionists. After Conan Doyle's son, Kingsley, perished from the flu pandemic, the author became a fervent supporter of the movement. He'd already fostered a growing interest in the subject before his son's demise, studying ghosts, fairies, and other supernatural entities for decades. Kingsley's passing acted as a catalyst, and Conan Doyle continued studying the occult with zeal, and even Conan Doyle's second wife, Jean, claimed to be an automatic writer and medium of sorts. They claimed to communicate with an entity named Phineas, who would regularly warn them of impending disaster. Houdini's ability to escape bound chains and make things as large as an elephant disappear won him fans with some, like Conan Doyle, believing the illusionist had innate psychic abilities, which Houdini always refuted. Houdini knew how to perform sleight of hand and create realistic illusions, which is how he easily debunked many mediums, who often cited shaking tables and wobbling chairs as empirical evidence of the afterlife. Houdini once told a reporter, whenever any of these alleged spiritual mediums tell you that they have supernatural aid, you may safely set them down as frauds. In order to thwart the pseudo-psychics and mediums, Houdini employed a number of secret employees. By the time spiritualism hit its heyday in the 1920s, Houdini had been to hundreds of seances, and he couldn't cover all the ground. He hired a few people he deemed his own secret service to unveil the con artists he believed were taking advantage of desperate people. One member of a secret service, Rose Mackenberg, a private investigator in Houdini's employment, said she attended over 300 seances in the two years she worked for the magician. In one instance, an alleged psychic tried to charge Mackenberg $25 for his services. He also claimed that taking off her clothes would help her communicate with the other side better. She declined, and after she told Houdini he humiliated the man at one of his own shows. A devout spiritualist who also emulated all that was rational with his character, Sherlock Holmes, Conan Doyle proposed a contest to detect whether or not mediums were the real deal. The magazine Scientific American ran a contest that offered a hefty $2,500 prize to any psychic or medium who could empirically prove they possessed the supernatural gift. Scientific American enlisted a crew of highly revered minds in the scientific community, including an engineer-physicist from MIT, 
two researchers who dedicated their lives to studying the paranormal, and the one and only Houdini. The magazine counted on these experts to deduce whether or not psychics possessed a sort of undiscovered force that granted them powers. Naturally, many so-called psychics and mediums were eager to prove to Scientific American that they were legitimate and collect the reward of $2,500 for being so. But Houdini and the rest of the panel were able to easily discredit any supposed medium, largely in thanks to Houdini's experience as an illusionist. The magician told the Los Angeles Times, it takes a flim-flammer to catch a flim-flammer, and he caught a slew of flim-flammers. He proved that 19-year-old Joaquin Maria Argamasilla, who claimed he could see through metals like gold and silver, was a fraud in a very public manner. He called the Spaniard with X-ray vision out and promised to replicate his so-called power at the Pennsylvania Hotel. Houdini proved that all Argamasilla was doing was taking a peek in the box and then saying what was in it, but was doing so in a manner so discreet that many audiences could not tell. Houdini continued to out would-be mediums, like Nino Pecorero, a boy medium who had fooled the rest of the panel twice before. On the third time, when Houdini was present, he was unable to replicate his psychic abilities. Houdini, along with the help of the rest of the committee from Scientific American, were able to discredit most psychics or mediums with relative ease. But that all changed around 1924, when Mina Crandon, also known as Marjorie the Medium, took the spiritualist world by storm. The medium was the first to produce conclusive psychic manifestations to prove her psychic prowess, like ectoplasm. She also often sported semi-transparent clothes to prove she wasn't hiding anything or performing trickeries, although the outfits may have been distracting to her male judges enough to make them believe her. Houdini and the other judges attended two seances of hers in Boston in July of 1924. He claimed that he saw her escape constraints and ring a bell, meant for a spiritual entity to use to signify its presence, with her foot. Everyone except Houdini remained convinced. Marjorie the medium continued to gain massive popularity, much to Houdini's chagrin. In order to definitively prove that she wasn't an actual medium, Houdini resorted to bizarre and, at times, reputation-ruining tactics. In order to prevent Marjorie from using her legs in any way during the seance, Houdini placed her in a boxed contraption during the event. The bell still rang, even though she was boxed in, but it appeared that the lid of the box had been forced open. Houdini knew Marjorie forced her way through, but the other judges weren't so convinced. He also wrote the article, Marjorie the Medium Exposed, even though his Scientific American colleagues weren't on board with his claims. He called out one of the magazine's writers for even entertaining the idea of awarding Marjorie the prize money. He even went as far as to say that he would give up $1,000 if he was not able to prove that she was a fraud. If you give this award to a medium, without the strictest examination, every fraudulent medium in the world will take advantage of it, he said. I will forfeit $1,000 if I do not detect her if she resorts to trickery. Of course, if she is genuine, there's nothing to expose. But if the Scientific American, by any accident, should declare her genuine and she was eventually detected in fraud, we would be the laughingstock of the world, and in the meantime, hundreds of fraudulent mediums would have taken advantage of the error. Houdini had proved his point, and Marjorie was revealed to be yet another fraud. Once Houdini had outed Marjorie as another trickster, it had a profound impact on his friendship with Arthur Conan Doyle. Conan Doyle had proudly touted Marjorie as the real deal, and after Houdini's tirade against her, they had a rather public falling out. Conan Doyle wrote a piece for the January 26, 1925 issue of the Boston Herald saying, "...it is that of Houdini, the eminent conjurer. Houdini was first present at two sittings, a long series of phenomena occurred." Houdini passed them at the time, raised no objection, and signed the accounts as being correct. Nonetheless, though, he could say nothing before the Crandons. He wrote the people at a distance who had no means of checking his statement to say the program was fraudulent. The Sherlock Holmes author was upset that Houdini didn't suggest that Marjorie was a fraud during the seances, but rather later from afar. 
their relationship never quite recovered. As a final test to see whether or not spiritualism was real, Houdini gave his wife Bess a secret code if he were to perish before her. The idea was that Houdini would use the secret code to contact Bess, proving that an afterlife did exist and that there was a way to communicate with those in it. He passed 20 years before his wife on October 31, 1926. The code was allegedly supposed to translate into Rosabelle Believe, but Bess never heard the phrase, even though others claimed they did. She allegedly burned a candle for her late husband for 10 years before she finally gave up, saying 10 years was long enough to wait for any man. Modern-day illusionists, such as Penn and Teller, often cite Houdini as an inspiration, especially when it comes to debunking supernatural claims. The famous duo had a series called Bullshit on Showtime from 2003 until 2010, which followed the duo as they discredited so-called psychics and mediums across the globe. Late sleight-of-hand performer Ricky Jay also exposed fraud and trickery, like that of carnival tricks. He was called one of the best sleight-of-hand performers, and like Houdini, his expertise in illusion also made him very capable of sniffing out other forms of trickery. Up next, there are strong women, there are formidable ladies, there are tough cookies, there are female baddies, and then there is stagecoach Mary Fields, who was surely in a class all her own. Also, dozens of creepy stories and urban legends have sprouted up along America's most legendary highway. We'll look at some of the horrifying things people have experienced on Route 66. These stories and more when Weird Darkness Returns. Hey, weirdos! If you want to find out where I'm going to be headed in the weeks and months to come, you're going to want to keep a close eye on the events calendar at WeirdDarkness.com. For example, May 27th through the 29th, I'm taking the Weird Darkness table to the UFO Disclosure Symposium in Vernal, Utah. June 26th, I'll be just outside of Chicago in Summit, Illinois for the Chicago Paranormal Conference. August 19th and 20th, I'm heading to Champaign, Illinois for the Dark Horror and History Con. September 23rd through the 25th, I'm making my way to Kansas City to hang out with Jared Padalecki, Jensen Ackles, and the rest of the Supernatural TV show cast at the Supernatural Fan Convention. October 14th, it's the Milwaukee Paranormal Conference in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I'm adding more dates all the time. The calendar just keeps getting updated, so find the details for these dates and others that are coming up on the events calendar at WeirdDarkness.com, and I'll see you somewhere along the haunted highways. As is the case with so many larger-than-life figures, much of Mary Field's life history is murky and a good part of the rest shrouded in the fog of mythology, but there is enough reliable information to guarantee her an honored place in the episodes of Weird Darkness. Fields was born into slavery, possibly in Tennessee, sometime around 1832. She first appears in the historical record as a slave in the West Virginia household of a family named Warner. When she was freed by the Emancipation Proclamation, she made one vow – that no one would dominate her again. As she was over six feet tall, weighed around 200 pounds, and could pick up a quarter of beef like a potato, the wise were happy to oblige her. The newly freed fields took to the road. She traveled up the Mississippi River, working on the riverboats and acting as a servant for families who lived along the river. By 1870, she was again working for the Warners, this time as a paid domestic servant. When one of the Warner daughters became a nun, Fields accompanied her to the Ursuline Convent of the Sacred Heart in Toledo, Ohio. Mary became the convent's groundskeeper. It made for an odd mix. It's said that when one of the nuns asked if she had a good journey, Fields replied, I'm ready for a good cigar and a drink. Mary's proud nature fiery temper and difficult personality brought an unaccustomed volatility to the hitherto peaceful convent, especially when you messed with her gardens. Mary was a passionate and skilled gardener, and when anyone interfered with her landscaping, prayers were needed. God help anyone who walked on the lawn after Mary had cut it, 
one nun later recollected. In 1884, the convent's head, Mother Amadeus, was sent to St. Peter's Mission in Montana Territory in order to establish a school for Native American girls. When Mother Amadeus came down with pneumonia a short time later, Fields, along with several nuns, went to St. Peter's to help keep the mission going. After Mother Amadeus' recovery, Fields decided that the wild, wild west was much more her style than the staid atmosphere of Toledo. She stayed on at the mission as a general caretaker, raising vegetables, tending chickens, hunting game birds, doing laundry, and repairing buildings. She had free room and board at the mission, but refused to accept a salary. Fields wanted to have her independence, and remaining a non-contracted worker enabled her to come and go as she pleased. In the words of Field's biographer, D. Garceau Hagen, the former slave relished the pungency of freedom. The locals didn't know what to make of Mary Fields. An Amazon-sized black woman who drank, smoked, swore, was as strong as any male, hauled freight, and readily raised hell with anyone who crossed her was a whole new experience for them. The Native Americans dubbed her White Crow, as she was someone who acts like a white woman but has black skin. A white schoolgirl wrote an essay about her, noting more bluntly, she drinks whiskey and she swears, and she is a Republican which makes her a low, foul creature. One day in 1892, she had a row with John Mosney, one of the mission's male hired hands. It's surmised that he objected to taking orders from a black woman, or maybe he walked on her lawn. The quarrel culminated with the pair pointing rifles at each other. After that episode, the bishop decided Fields was too, well, vivid a personality for their cloistered society, and he ordered that she be banned from the mission. He probably felt she was just too much for God. As overbearing and troublesome as Fields could be, the nuns at St. Peter's had become attached to her, though, and felt that the eviction was horribly unfair. Fields, too, had hoped to stay at the mission for the rest of her days. However, orders from up top were orders from up top, leaving them with no choice but to obey. Fields moved to the nearby town of Cascade, where, with the help of Mother Amadeus, she opened a small restaurant. As cantankerous as she could be, Fields was also open-handed, generous and unconcerned about money, which guaranteed her failure as a businesswoman. She readily served meals to everyone who dropped in, blissfully unconcerned about whether or not they could pay for the food. You'll not be surprised, then, that the eatery folded in less than a year. She went on to do a series of odd jobs after that, becoming locally famous for her fondness for whiskey and her irascibility. The town's newspaper claimed, with a distinct air of pride, that Fields had broken more noses than any other person in Montana. When one man was crude, not to say suicidal enough to hurl a racial slur in her direction, Mary sent him to the hospital with a broken head. In 1896, she applied for a job as a mail carrier. Local postal employees were dubious about hiring a woman in her 60s until, much to their astonishment, they saw that she could hitch a team of horses faster than any man. She was only the second woman and the first black woman to work for the Postal Service. In 19th century Montana, delivering the mail was not a job for the weak and timid. On her route, fields had to face primitive or non-existent roads, often harsh weather and the occasional highwayman. None of this phased fields in the least. If her stagecoach broke down, she fixed it. If the winter snows grew too heavy for the horses, she would put on snowshoes, toss the sacks of mail over her mighty shoulders, and deliver them on foot. If anyone tried to rob her, she shot them. According to one story, she once took on a pack of wolves and won. She never missed a day. Before long, her stellar record earned her the affectionate nickname of Stagecoach Mary. Our intrepid heroine, Cascade's only black resident, became a near-folkloric figure in the area. Despite the inevitable racial prejudice she often encountered, to many people she was a source of local pride, or in the words of the town's newspaper, a sort of landmark. Another thing that set Fields apart is that, after leaving St. Peter's, she no longer sought the company of women, white or black. She ignored the black community institutions being formed in Montana, and there's no evidence she participated in any white churches or civic groups. 
Instead, her main socializing was with white men in their standard pursuits – sports events, billiard halls, and saloons. Her anomalous role in Cascade's society only intensified her already colorful reputation, giving her a curious license enjoyed by neither black men or white women. Fields retired from her route in 1903, at the age of approximately 71. She occupied herself with babysitting, operating a laundry service, gardening, watching baseball games – she loved the sport – and, of course, whiskey. Mary stayed Mary to the end. According to one report, when a customer failed to pay his laundry bill, she broke his nose. She'd give flowers from her garden to the home baseball team and give the umpire hell when he called against them. Stagecoach Mary died of heart disease in 1914. Her funeral, held appropriately enough at the town theater, was one of the largest the area had ever seen. Spanning a massive 2,451 miles across the United States, it's not surprising that dozens of creepy stories and urban legends have sprouted up along America's most legendary highway. Some are disgusting, some are creepy, and some you don't want to think about again while you're alone in your room. There are numerous creepy stories and legends based around Route 66. Route 66 is a long stretch of highway, meaning you can't drive at all without making a few stops. But if you must stop, avoid the Hotel Monte Vista. According to Haunted Route 66, Ghosts of America's Legendary Highway, reports from that hotel indicate restless spirits like to roam the halls. Especially avoid the second floor, which is supposedly haunted by so many spirits, hotel management can't put pets on that floor or they freak out. The scariest place might be the basement, where reports of a baby crying over and over again have been made quite a few times. In Missouri, there's a stretch of road that's officially called Lawler Ford Road, The people around the area have just come to call it Zombie Road. The road was paved at some point, but now has become almost impossible to pass using an automobile. A lot of stories have come from Zombie Road whether it be the ghost of a man hit by a train in the 1970s or the mysterious old woman who screams at people from a house at the end of the road, but what built up Zombie Road the most was the death of Della Hamilton McCullough way back in 1876 when she was hit by a railroad car. Reports of phantom glows with bluish-white light and a translucent figure wandering around have been said to be McCullough, still haunting the place where she died. Route 666, no surprise, is the sixth branch of Route 66, and its long stretch of road has been responsible for countless ghost stories and encounters. The scariest might come from Linda Dunning, who wrote about an incident with her husband. Apparently, the man was driving down Route 666 late at night and in the distance saw a burning truck flying toward him with no signs of stopping. He pulled off quickly to the side of the road and walked into the desert about 20 feet from his car in order to let the flaming truck pass. After it raced by him, he got back in his car and continued on like a smart person. One of the many tourist attractions along Route 66, the Merrimack Caverns, get close to 150,000 visitors a year, not counting all the ghosts. Some of the more frequent sightings include a Native American woman who likes to stand in a distant pool of water, a woman in a formal dress, most likely from one of the many galas older generations threw in the caverns, and a mysterious man in black, who many speculate might be the infamous Jesse James himself. At the Peace Church Cemetery in Joplin, Missouri, an unmarked grave apart from everyone else holds the remains of one of the most notorious spree killers of the 1950s. Billy Cook Jr. had a rough childhood. Abused by the system, one day he snapped and went on a desperate run to Oklahoma City, killing several people before getting arrested and executed. His body was transported back to his hometown, but the cemetery only agreed to bury him if it was an unmarked grave. 
Reports tell of strange lantern lights around his grave, and sometimes, if you're unlucky enough, you might see Billy standing at the tree line, eyes filled with hate. It's always a good choice to honor your dead. In the Oak Hill Cemetery in Kansas, a state Route 66 passes through for only 13 miles, a man did not give his wife a proper funeral, burying her in the cheapest coffin possible and not spending anything for the service. A few days after his wife was buried, the gravestone cracked. The widower replaced the gravestone, but it cracked again. He replaced it a few more times, each time ending with a cracked gravestone. It forced the man to move away from the town. Now there was his first good idea. The Coleman Theater in Miami, Oklahoma was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1983. Once a thriving place for people to watch movies, now people can arrange tours of the restored old theater, but they might get a little more than they bargained for. According to local legend, the theater was built on a mortuary, and underneath the main seating area is a crematorium. Visitors have reported extreme heat coming from that room, accompanied by unknown whistling sounds. James Phillips was a prisoner in Guthrie, Oklahoma, when he died an unexpected death. He was sentenced to hanging, but the prison hadn't hanged somebody in quite some time, so an entire scaffold had to be built from scratch. Unfortunately, it took some time, and Phillips could see it being built from his cell. Soon after, guards found him dead of heart failure, citing the stress of watching his own execution come together. To this day, guards can still hear footsteps and a face looking out the window to where the scaffold was being built. In Denton, the old Alton, aka the Argyle Bridge, was built in 1884. Today, most locals refer to it as Goatman's Bridge. As the legend goes, a horned man-goat can sometimes be seen on or around the bridge, usually right before a disaster is reported. The creature supposedly lives in the woods nearby, waiting for unsuspecting people to pounce upon and eat. So if you're traveling there, it might be best to avoid the bridge altogether. At the Catfish Plantation in Waxahachie, Texas, multiple spirits are said to haunt the grounds. None are more tragic than the ghost of Elizabeth Anderson. If the stories are true, it's said that in the early 1900s, a jealous ex-boyfriend burst into the house and killed Anderson on her wedding day. She was still wearing her white wedding dress. Now she can either be seen in the dining room or looking out a bay window in the front room where she was killed. Further into the town of Waxahachie is Becky Road, which according to legend is where the last Confederate soldier of the Civil War was hanged. His name was Private John Heinrich, and he was hanged from a tree. Years after his execution, people still talk about seeing a young man standing on the side of the road in a Confederate uniform. Some claim they can still see him hanging from the tree where he died. In Arlington, there's a local legend regarding River Legacy Park. It states how a group of Confederate soldiers used to capture Union soldiers and hang them on big trees looking toward a giant gate. Because of the ordeal, the gate soon became known as Hell's Gate, as it was usually the last thing the Union soldiers saw. It's rumored that over a hundred soldiers were killed there, and their sobs and cries can still be heard today. In 1897, a massive fire broke out in the Buckner Orphan's Home in Dallas. Being made almost entirely of wood, the building went up quickly, taking the lives of 15 male orphans who were unlucky enough to be trapped inside. They were all buried in the cemetery behind the orphanage, but reports say crying can still be heard along with an unexplained burning smell. Not much can be said of the phantom killer of Texarkana because, sadly, he was never caught. He showed up in a four-month period in 1946 and earned his name by only attacking at night. By the time he was through, at least seven people were killed, with maybe more never to be discovered. Although the phantom killer was never found, a few of his victims can still be seen haunting the places where they died. As the story goes, in the late 1600s, Spanish soldier Juan Trevino met a beautiful girl who he fell madly in love with, 
even though she was already getting married to someone else. Desperate, Trevino turned to two witches for a love potion. They sold him one for a high price, but the woman still ended up marrying the other man. Furious, Trevino confronted the witches for a refund, and a fight broke out when they said no. It ended with the two witches triumphant, decapitating poor Trevino and burying him away from his head. Now his spirit wanders, apparently searching for the witches who killed him, or his missing head. In the Manal Boulevard neighborhood, everyone apparently knows that the hills in the distance are haunted. Taking a walk among the foothills at night can lead to encounters with strange lights and odd noises, including laughing and gunshots. There's also a cave in the hills from which people sometimes claim to see a bright light emanating, but when anyone has the courage to go check it out, it always vanishes. And in Devore, California, at the Treehouse Fun Ranch off of Route 66, a truck driver frequented the nudist colony there so often that he had his ashes delivered to the place once he died. His urn rested behind the counter for years, with everyone forgetting about them and ownership switching hands. Once the new owners renovated, they found the ashes and moved them. As soon as they did, ghostly events started happening, including a self-starting fire pit and several electrical disturbances. So if you plan to take a long road trip vacation down Route 66, enjoy the history, but be ready for the hauntings. When Weird Darkness returns, it was one of the wildest and wickedest of all Wild West towns, and now it's one of the most haunted. Jerome, Arizona is considered the most haunted town in the state, possibly in all of the United States. Hey Weirdos, our next Weirdo Watch Party is Friday, May 13th. That's right, we're doing a Weirdo Watch Party on the unluckiest day on the calendar. And you thought horror movies couldn't get any worse. Horror host Vincent Price, um, sorry, uh, Princeton, Princeton Vice, there you go, that's how we say it. Anyway, he brings us 1946's The Curse of the Raidens. This movie is a character based on Spring-Heeled Jack, which we've talked about here on Weird Darkness. It stars Todd Slaughter, and his acting and facial expressions are so over the top, you can probably describe him as an early cinema B-movie version of Jim Carrey. The Weirdo Watch Party is always free, so grab your popcorn, candy, and soda and jump into the live chat, or just sit back and watch this horrible B-movie with a fun horror host, Friday, May 13th. It's The Curse of the Raidens, presented by Vincent Pr Pr no, uh, Princeton Vice. The fun begins at 5 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Mountain, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. in Hawaii, and 1 a.m. for our Greenwich Mean Time viewers. And if you don't want to wait until showtime for the fun, well, the Weirdo Watch Party page is always streaming horror hosts and B-horror movies all day long, every day of the year, on the Weirdo Watch Party page at WeirdDarkness.com. The town of Jerome, Arizona sits between Flagstaff and Prescott in the Black Hills of Yavapai County, and its strange history draws visitors year after year. Founded in 1876, Jerome was a mining town that quickly flourished when copper, gold, and silver were all found in the area. The town boasted a number of successful restaurants, gambling halls, and saloons, as well as an active red light district. In its heyday, Jerome had 15,000 residents, but by the 1950s, less than 200 people called Jerome home. Living residents, anyway. Jerome is said to be the most haunted town in the state of Arizona, perhaps even the United States. Things to do in Jerome include visiting a hospital-turned-hotel where patients and staff still roam the halls. You can also visit the many saloons and bordellos that saw high levels of mischief and mayhem. There's even a phantom cat who's always happy to spend the night with visitors in its former home. The history of Jerome, Arizona is complicated and a little murky, but these are some of the best-known stories of hauntings and paranormal phenomena that the city has to offer. Long before it became a paranormal tourist destination, 
The Jerome Grand Hotel was the United Verde Hospital. From 1927 to 1950, it's estimated that nearly 9,000 people expired there, often during surgery. When the hotel opened its doors in 1996, guests immediately began to report paranormal activity, including disembodied voices and a phantom gurney in the hallway. The hotel staff has embraced the intense hauntings and keeps a 300-page notebook in the lobby for guests to write their experiences in. They have to replace the notebook every year. The third floor of the hotel is said to be the most haunted, since it's where the old operating room was located. The most haunted room is thought to be number 32, where two people took their own lives. Guests often report seeing orbs and shadowy figures, and are encouraged to ride the original Otis elevator with the ghost of Claude Harvey, a maintenance man who met his end there in 1935. Some guests report hearing a squeaky gurney on a linoleum floor outside their door, even though all the hallways are now carpeted. Staff have reported receiving phone calls at the front desk from unoccupied rooms as well. One of the harsh realities of living in Jerome was the constant danger experienced by women. Sammy Dean was a Texan woman who grew up poor and worked in both a clothing factory and dry goods store at the turn of the 20th century. While records on Dean's adult life are spotty, she eventually ended up working at one of the more upscale bordellos in Jerome. Dean did well for herself living in Jerome. She owned her own car, had an extravagant collection of jewelry, and was popular with clients in the red light district. She met a tragic demise in her own home, though, on the evening of July 10, 1930, according to reports. The scene looked like a robbery gone wrong, since both Dean's sidearm and large stash of cash were missing, and the place had been ransacked. However, all of her expensive jewelry was left untouched. Rumors floated around Jerome that the mayor's son was the culprit after Dean refused to marry him, but the case remains unsolved to this day. Today, the ghost of Sammy Dean is said to roam the alleys of the old red-light district, and some people think her spirit is still in search of the one who did her wrong. The population of Jerome steadily grew throughout the late 1800s, and it was mostly composed of male miners. A common estimate is that the population of the town was 78% male. The gender discrepancy in Jerome led to the building of a number of saloons, gambling halls, and bordellos which contributed to high levels of hostility and aggression. There was even a section of Jerome nicknamed Husband's Alley, containing a number of brothels and bordellos with varying levels of respectability. While you could get rich from mining in Jerome, there was an increasingly high chance of also getting robbed, or worse. Jerome's unsavory reputation spread across the country, and in 1903, the New York Sun ran an article declaring Jerome the wickedest city in the West. When Jerome saw three catastrophic fires in an 18-month period, some thought it was some sort of divine punishment for the sinful nature of the city. But Jerome rebuilt itself every time. With its predominantly male population, Bordellos were one of the main ways miners could uh, relax after a day of hard labor in Jerome. The most successful bordello in town was Jenny's Place, which was run by Jenny Botters, a Belgian immigrant who, while not the first madam in Jerome, was definitely the most successful. Jenny's life was cut short by a client in 1905, and some say she never left her bordello again. Now called the Mile High Inn, the site is home to countless reports of paranormal phenomena of all types, including multiple sightings of Jenny herself. The housekeeping staff seems to be Jenny's prime target. Perhaps the former madam wants to make sure everything is done to her liking. When it's not, the ghost has been known to throw objects across the room to get the staff's attention. The Mile High Inn hosts a number of spirits, including its former owner, and a male apparition who enjoys poking and pushing unsuspecting guests. Perhaps the strangest case of ghostly activity is the inn's ghost cat, who is said to have belonged to the original owner, Jenny Botters. Guests have reported seeing paw prints and indentations on their beds even though there are no living animals in the building. One guest heard scratching at the door to their room, 
but saw no cat when they opened the door. This phantom cat is supposed to look so real guests have even tried picking it up, only to have the cat shockingly vanish in their arms. Consider that your warning if you visit the Mile High Inn and see a cat who looks like it just wants a scritch. Originally referred to as Connor's Corner, the Connor Hotel opened as a luxury hotel in 1897, only to burn to the ground a year later. It would be rebuilt and then damaged two more times, by fire, yet the alleged hauntings at the Connor seem unrelated to this unfortunate series of events. While supernatural activity has been reported throughout the hotel, room number one is considered to be the most haunted, and it is rarely booked by guests. One man was kept awake most of the night by the disembodied sound of women's laughter and whispering inside his seemingly empty room. Objects have been known to move on their own, and the doors of the room's armoire will sometimes open and close, perhaps with the assistance of a phantom hand. A woman in a red dress has also been seen in the room, as well as the apparition of the hotel's original owner, David Connor. Connor is usually spotted staring out the window, only to vanish before the witness's eyes. If you miss him there, Connor's often seen at his other favorite spot, the hotel bar. As if Jerome wasn't bizarre enough with its above-ground hauntings, there are also 88 miles of sprawling tunnels that sneak beneath the town where men mined for their fortunes. With so many men working deep below ground in hazardous conditions, it's no surprise that restless spirits still wander the tunnels they labored in over a century ago. The most infamous ghost story from the mines is that of Headless Charlie, whose head was apparently relieved of his body in a freak mining incident and never found. Shortly after Charlie's horrific passing, miners started finding large footprints similar to Charlie's throughout the mines. There have also been multiple reports of screams and moaning coming from the abandoned mines. The mines are closed to the public, but local lore has it that Charlie still walks the tunnels in an eternal search for his head. Fun fact, there was a Jerome-based band called Headless Charlie, named in homage to the Phantom Miner. The now-historic Jerome Valley Cemetery opened in March 1917 on 40 acres of rolling fields. While 40 acres seems like more than enough room considering the town's population, space quickly became tight during the influenza outbreak of 1918. Records show 51 people were buried in a single month during the height of the flu outbreak. Burials declined after 1919, and the last grave was dug in 1975. There could be more than 700 people buried in Jerome Valley today, but grave markers have been stolen over the years, and most of the burial records were destroyed in the 1950s. There have been many alleged sightings of spirits walking through the cemetery, ghost lights and wraiths that make themselves known after the sun sets on Jerome. The dangerous nature of mining work made the hospital in Jerome essential, but medical treatment and surgery were still coming out of the Dark Ages in post-Civil War America. Amputations were commonly practiced for injured miners, and patients more often than not never left the hospital. The influenza outbreak of 1918 also proved too much for the small hospital to manage, and staff were forced to burn unclaimed patients in the incinerator, according to local lore. It's also been said that the smelters used by the mines also saw a burning or two. Visitors to Jerome have reported apparitions staring out the windows of the now-abandoned hospital, and it's a popular stop on local ghost tours. Originally built as housing for local mine managers, Ghost City Inn has also served as a restaurant, spiritual retreat, private residence, and even a funeral home during its long history in Jerome. A male and female spirit have both been seen by multiple guests in or near the Verda View and Cleopatra Hill rooms, respectively, though their identities are unknown. There's also been reported poltergeist activity, such as disembodied voices heard in seemingly empty rooms and doors slamming of their own accord. The current owners note on their website that the inn takes its name from Jerome's own nickname of Ghost City. As to whether Ghost City Inn is truly haunted, the owners say it may be, 
but it's ultimately up to the guests to decide for themselves if anything goes bump in the night. While its official name is Lawrence Memorial Hall, Jerome's Community Center is commonly referred to as Spook Hall by locals who embrace the abundance of paranormal activity in the town. While no one is known to have expired at Spook Hall, it is said still to be haunted by the ghost of a young woman in 19th century attire. Bordello workers allegedly used the site now occupied by Spook Hall to entertain their customers. One such woman met a grisly fate, and her spirit is now bound to the land. Her ghost has been seen through Spook Hall over the years, and she has a reputation for knocking things over to make her presence known. When the mines finally closed for good in the early 1950s, Jerome's population dwindled to somewhere between 50 and 200 people. The residents left behind only stayed because they couldn't afford to move anywhere else. There was even talk of demolishing the entire town because no one could figure out how to revive it. Yet Jerome has always proved to be remarkably resilient. It did burn down three times and bounce back, after all. In 1967, the town became a National Historic Landmark, and by the late 1970s, an active artist community had moved into the town and set up a historical society. Jerome began marketing itself as Ghost City and the original ghost town. Jerome has thrived ever since, and the number of living residents is now somewhere around 500. Of course, we know there are still a countless number of not-so-alive residents still lurking around. Thanks for listening through to the end of the episode. Because you've done that, you get to hear a quick sample of the newest episode from Allegedly starring Jonathan Frakes. Here it is. My name is Richard Golden, and my father was a victim of the biggest financial crime in history. And my name is Adam Prince, host and producer of today's true crime podcast, Money Supply. Rich, would you please tell us a little bit about your father and your relationship with him? Well, from the time I can remember as a Navy captain, all of the crew that he interacted with always had so much respect for him and in the corporate world, the same thing. But yet he always had time to take his sons out for batting practice. And we just always looked up to him in so many different ways. Sounds like he was your personal hero. Absolutely. You ever hear a story and you think, come on, that can't be true? Of course, a tall tale, right? Which is how I would describe your story. I mean, true or not true, it's a whopper. Well, this is all based on documents my father created, which would be admissible in a court of law. In other words, it's more than just hearsay. Okay, let's start at the top. All right, my dad, Roger Golden, was a high-powered corporate attorney, never lost a case. In 1988, not long before the fall of the Berlin Wall, he was approached by the owner of a brokerage firm in Chicago. Let's call him the broker. In fact, the only real name we're going to use is for Rich's dad. So the brokerage company earned a big commission on a massive transfer of wealth from the Soviet Union. Basically, the Russians had been hoarding gold for centuries uh, as the Soviet Union was teetering the powers that be arranged for uh, gold reserves to leave the USSR and enter the Western economy by depositing them into a bank in Hong Kong. Uh, the broker had been working on this deal for a while, um, facilitating the transfer, and for that he was to receive quite a large commission. But as that money came into the US, it was flagged by the Treasury Department and held up indefinitely. So the broker brought in my father to essentially unstick the gears and get the Treasury Department to release the funds. How large a commission are we talking here? $1.7 trillion. You mean billion, right? No, oh, you heard me right the first time. Uh, $1.7 trillion with a T. See what I mean? So, Rich, can you explain how this astronomical number came about? And just for context, the total amount of goods and services produced in Russia, the GDP, was around $500 billion that year. That's not even a third of your father's $1.7 trillion commission. And the world GDP, all the economies on Earth put together, the GDP for that was $22.5 trillion. $1.7 trillion was just the commission. How big was this deal? How much money was being transferred? A lot. Clearly, but how much? Well, I don't know exactly. Did your dad know? 
I'm not sure, but I know it sounds weird, but let me explain. Please. So the number 1.7 trillion was predetermined and did not reflect a normal percentage of the deal. Years later, he would come to understand better where this crazy high number comes from. Basically, uh, if you recall, uh, in the 70s, the early 1970s, the world economy was swimming in petrodollars, money made from the sale of oil, which was astronomically high during a series of oil shocks throughout the, the decade. U.S. and banks around the world had a problem. What to do with all that money? They lent it to the third world nations in South and Central America, but it soon became apparent that those countries would not be able to pay the money back. They took out loans just to pay the interest back on the principal. The bottom line is it left a $1.7 trillion hole in the U.S. economy. Uh, so the head of the CIA at the time came up with a fix to the problem he called Project Rosebud. Uh, it would take another decade or so for this plan to be put into action. And by then he was, uh, let's just say, about as high up in government as you can get. What did your father think about all this? Surely he had questions. Well, first of all, my dad and the broker had no idea there was a larger game being played. From their perspective, this was just a straight up business deal. The only thing that was unusual about it was the fact that it originated in Russia and, of course, the size of the deal itself. I have to imagine your dad stood to make a ton of money himself. Well, not as much as you would think. He was also... Uh, getting ready to retire. He actually did retire once, but uh, he lost everything he had in a bad business deal. Uh, he came out of retirement, which is how he met the broker. Uh, Dad got his house in order and he was ready to retire for good. He promised my mom they'd travel and play a lot of golf. He knew that in any case, when you go up against the government, it had the potential to drag out. So he didn't want to take it to that length. So he tells the broker no, right? Well, he meets with him and does, uh, in the courtesy of hearing him out, the broker's desperate and my dad's friendly with him. So he's like, I'll think about it. But in his heart, he's looking for a way to turn it down. We, of course, weren't in the room with Roger back in 1988. But if we were, and we'd recorded these conversations on a cassette, they might have sounded something like this. Roger? Didn't expect to see you here. I had a more entertaining evening playing with my wife, but mind if I... Sure, sure. Come on in. When I left your office, I was coming up with half a dozen other lawyers to foist you off to. Why? This would be the biggest case of your career. Exactly why I was going to say no. Do you play golf? Not well. I'm no Nicholas. And my wife, she's nipping at my heels. She'll beat me if we play enough. And that's the thing. We've been married 30 years. Made it through lots of ups and downs. But it's time to bury the briefcase. You go up against the government, they'll wear you down. It's a battle of wills, and it takes time. But you're ready to trade in your loafers for spikes, huh? Couldn't have said it better. Yet, you're standing here in my house, dripping water on my floor. Well... I left your office today and went down the elevator. As I walked to my car, the G-man came over, flashed a badge from the treasury. He told me I'd be smart to back away from this case. He said, back away? And he brought up your record. Oh. Look, I don't mean to embarrass you, but we're better off if we lay our cards on the table. I know you served two years. I knew that when we met. Of course. You do your homework. I admit, I was wary at first, but you paid your debt to society, and you've proven to be a stand-up guy. Is that why the Treasury is holding up my funds? My fraud conviction? Even if Mother Teresa was a recipient, a fund transfer this large will ring bells in every Treasury office from here to D.C. I was told the government needs to study the impact of releasing the funds. Maybe. But it's not the whole story. When someone tells me that I shouldn't dig somewhere, the first thing I do is grab my shovel. His shovel being a writ of mandamus. 
A writ of what? Mandamus. My father and you, a judge in the D.C. circuit, and filed it with him. It's basically an order from a federal judge, in this case, to the Department of Treasury. Order to what? To knock it off, basically, and hand over the money, plus interest and damages. More than $1.7 trillion? Yeah, the final number landed somewhere between 6 and $8 trillion. The interesting thing is the powers that be never expected this case to actually land in federal court, but the order also had the World Bank attached to it, which is ironically why it was accepted into the federal court. So the judge sided with the broker? Yes, sir, and he sent the writ. I'm guessing that didn't do the trick. No, it did not. If you want to hear the rest of this episode of Allegedly, you can listen to it absolutely free. Just go to AllegedlyTrueCrime.com or search for Allegedly by Voyage Media wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. And please, leave a rating and review of the show in the podcast app you listen from. Doing so helps the show to get noticed. You can also email me anytime with your questions or comments through the website at WeirdDarkness.com. It's also where you can find all of my social media, listen to free audiobooks that I've narrated, shop the Weird Darkness store, sign up for the email newsletter to win monthly prizes, find other podcasts that I host, and find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Plus, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story or call the Dark Line toll-free at 1-877-277-5944. That's 1-877-277-5944. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. The Fox Sisters was written by Karen Abbott for Smithsonian Magazine. Houdini vs. Spiritualism was by Maggie Clancy for a Graveyard Shift. The Ballad of Stagecoach Mary is from Strange Company. Horrors of Route 66 is by Jacoby Bancroft for Ranker. And The Haunting of Jerome, Arizona was written by Patrick Thornton for Graveyard Shift. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marler House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 14. Do everything in love. And a final thought. A mistake that makes you humble is much better than an achievement that makes you arrogant. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Want to receive the commercial-free version of Weird Darkness every day? For just $5 per month, you can become a patron at WeirdDarkness.com. As a patron, you get commercial-free episodes of Weird Darkness every day, bonus audio, and you also receive chapters of audiobooks as I narrate them, even before the authors and publishers hear them. But more than that, as a patron, you're also helping to reach people who are desperately hurting with depression and anxiety. You get the benefits of being a patron, and you also benefit others who are hurting at the same time. Become a patron at WeirdDarkness.com.